it's uh, that golden shiny thing up in the sky. It's like, uh, what is that? So it's, uh, it's turning into a great day, and it's good to have you here today. Um, we have some celebrations. Uh, we don't have any anniversaries we're aware of, but while, while we're getting there, um, we have the connection card, so if there's information like to bring us up to date on or anything like that, um, use, the, uh, use the connection card for that. And we also have on, on the back, very conveniently, is the prayer card. So if there's prayers we can, we can lift up to you, uh, that would be a great way to do that. Um, this is going to bring a lot of us down um, because um, we'll sing happy birthday here shortly. Actually, let's sing happy birthday first, then we'll do the bad, bad news. Okay, so let's sing uh, Patty happy birthday. <laughs> tomorrow. Uh, some of you, I, I assume many of you have heard by now that Marjorie Pogus died this week. Um, it was unexpected and I spoke to the family uh, during the week and again yesterday. Uh, we're not sure yet when they will be able to uh, schedule a um, uh, funeral service. They've got family who are out of state and trying to decide when, when they can get up here. Um, uh, because uh, many of you remember Mary Crone's funeral, uh, a couple of years ago, that was also uh, um, a lot of Presbytery people came here as well as uh, the JLP community. So one of the things I did, because I know Marjorie had a lot of connections there and in Rotary and so forth, I said that uh, we may end up moving it to Trinity, uh, but that's something the family's thinking about because they really did identify this as Marjorie's church. So I will let you know as soon as I know more, but we're going to try and support the family however we can. Um, uh, let's see. Yes, we have giving, um, and worship will begin very soon indeed. Uh, Sunday school has started, um, and uh, there's also grown-up Sunday school. So Sunday, grown-up Sunday school is for the chosen. They're using the chosen TV series as the basis of a, or the kind of the, the, the guiding framework for a Bible study uh, based on the chosen. So uh, that will be next door at 1045-ish, so you can be part of that. And um, uh, speaking of Bible studies, there's a Bible study downstairs on Tuesdays at 10 a.m. And starting this week over at Trinity, if you're interested in a women's Bible study, there is the Surprised by Hope women's Bible study. It's based on um, N.T. Wright's uh, book of the same name, Surprised by Hope, and it's basically the uh, um, the end times, what, what Christians can... Uh, be surprised by and understanding the end time. So that's at 1030 on Wednesdays. Next, ask me anything. Boy, we're already coming up to a week, a Sunday with five, a month with five Sundays. So Sunday the 29th is a fifth Sunday. So we'll do an ask me anything then. And uh, so if you've got questions, start thinking about them. Uh, don't spoil them by asking me now. <laughs> or do. That's fine. Um, but uh, Get those, get those ideas uh, hatching. All right, Northwood cleanup. I don't have a date for this yet, so I don't know if you all talked among yourselves, but we should do it. Today would be a great day because it actually turned into a not rainy day, so I'm shocking. I I'm shocked by that, but anyway, um, I won't be part of it because I'll be running across town to the other church, so uh, Northwood cleanup, got to do it. All right, next, join our AV tech team back there so you can work those control rods and See the megawatts go to zero and then back up to a big number. All right, um, all right. Call to worship. We're what? We're not having a potluck next week. We're not. Oh, that's a leftover slide. Sorry, sorry. Brand X is having a potluck. So, so there are churches in our community that will be having a potluck. We just had ours back what the uh, last week of August, right? Can we go to there? You can actually. By all means. Um, uh, just FYI. Uh, they're going, you know, I, I used to admire their building, right? But for the past year, I've been learning a building comes with headaches. Many of you are homeowners and know this. So, um, so uh, 
they're getting new lighting in their in their sanctuary. So if you've been over there, you'll say that's far past time. They te definitely need new lighting. But there's going to be scaffolding and so forth. So we're planning some joint worship services. They will come here, and we'll probably just have two services so that they can be um, joining whichever one's more convenient. And so uh, we don't have room for all of them in this service, but we'll have a second service afterwards or something. We'll work that out uh, probably in October sometime. So yes, you can go to their. You can you know just crash right, crash their uh, uh, fellowship events, because really because. That would be a good thing to crash their fellowship events. Moving along, but we may have um, a, a Northwood cleanup, and who could turn one down for the other, right? All right, so call to worship. All right. The prophet Isaiah looks forward to the, the heavenly banquet, the, uh, the, the description that he uses to kind of encompass everything that God is doing is a banquet. He says, On this mountain, the Lord of heavenly forces will prepare for his people a rich feast a feast of choice wines, of select foods rich in favor, flavor, of choice wines well refined. He will swallow up on this mountain the veil that is veiling all peoples, the shroud enshrouding all nations. He will swallow up death forever. Let us pray. O oh God, you seek the lost with purpose, and you rejoice when you find them. Touch our hearts with grateful wonder at the tenderness of your patient love. Grant us delight in the mercy that has found us and bring all people to rejoice at the feast of forgiveness. We ask this through Jesus Christ, our Lord, who is alive and rules all things with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Please stand as you're able and join in singing our opening songs.
In the account of Pentecost we see in the book of Acts, God promises through the Apostle Peter that every sin can be forgiven. And if you're thinking, well, what about this one? Peter is talking to a group of people, some of whom were involved in crucifying Jesus. So he says to them, change your hearts and lives. Each of you must be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins. Then you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. This promise is for you your children, and for all who are far away, as many as the Lord God invites. So trusting in God's faithfulness and mercy, let us confess our sin before God and one another, first in silence. Let us pray. Loving and holy God, you've loved us with unfailing, self-giving mercy, but we have not loved you. You constantly call us, but we do not listen. You ask us to love, but we are consumed by our own concerns and indifferent to the needs of our neighbors. We excuse evil, prejudice, warfare, and greed. God of grace, as you come to us in mercy, we repent in spirit and truth. We admit our sin and we gratefully receive your forgiveness through Jesus Christ, our Redeemer. Amen. Amen. Hear the good news proclaimed through the Apostle Paul. He, Jesus, reconciled them both, both groups of people, as one body to God by the cross, which ended the hostility to God. When he came, he announced the good news of peace to you who were far away from God and to those who are near. People of God, look to the cross and believe the good news in Jesus Christ, you are forgiven. Thanks be to God. Since we have peace with God, let us be people of peace in the world. May the peace of the Lord Jesus Christ be with you. Please exchange a sign of peace with the people around you.
And my question for you is, so how, what, what's the biggest dinner that you've ever had at your house? Have you had like 10 people at your house? Maybe for Thanksgiving or something? Yeah, what, what's your answer? For Thanksgiving. Like Thanksgiving, yeah. So you probably had a lot of people there, cousins and aunts and uncles, yeah? Yeah? Uh, going to people's houses and just having a lot of food. Okay, so you've been to other people's houses for Thanksgiving, right? That's probably our biggest meal, most of us. Maybe we've got some special thing. There's a family event or something like that. But here's a question. How long do you think you'd have to go grocery shopping if you were going to feed 5,000 people? Yes. <laughs> It'd be a long, like, I don't know if you enjoy going grocery shopping, right? When I was your age, I hated going grocery shopping. My, my parents would argue about the prices of everything. So this is the 70s, right? So... So, um, so the answer in the Bible is no time at all. In fact, there was a problem. There weren't any grocery stores. And so there was no food. And there's 5,000, or in this case, uh, this, this version of the story, there's 4,000. So it happened a couple of times. So there's 4,000 people. And so Jesus says, well, what do you have? And somebody says, I've got seven loaves of bread. Now, we don't know for sure who that person was, but... In one of the stories about the feeding of the multitude, we read 
that the person who brought the food was, it says, um, a youth here has five barley loaves and two fish, but what good is that? So now you may say to yourself, suppose I told you there's 5,000 people coming to your house today for dinner, right? And you said, well, I've still got my lunch. I forgot to eat it at school on Friday. It's like, and here's my lunch box, and it's got like half a sandwich and an apple, right? Could you feed 5,000 people with that? Yeah. <laughs> no, no way, right? But here's the amazing thing. Jesus said, sure, give it to me. And then he did. He handed it out to all the people. They were all fed. They were all stuffed. They were like Thanksgiving, right? Where, you know, I have to go waddle out to the other room and watch TV for a while, right? That's how stuffed they were, right? Because they ate so much. And they, it all started with what a little boy brought to them. So you may be thinking, well, I'm just a kid. What do I have that Jesus could use? And the answer is you might be surprised. So, so if you bring what you've got to Jesus and say, Jesus, help people out with this, you may be surprised what Jesus can do with it. A lot of people were in the Bible. Let's pray. Let's pray. Lord God, we thank you that Jesus uh, can use something from everybody, not just from grown-ups, um, not just from grandparents and parents, but from even kids. Help us as grown-ups to appreciate what the gifts of young people might be um, to, the, to the work you're doing in and through this church. We pray it in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, well, thanks for coming up. All right, so um, I will put in a, an opportunity here. So um, we are looking for child care providers. So if you know anybody who's like in that right kind of doing nothing else on Sunday mornings and would love to uh, take care of our kids during not Sunday school, but just during worship on Sunday. So um, that would be great if you could let us know because we are actually, we have a position and we like to fund it. So, or it is funded. We just need to start spending. So help us to find the person to spend it on. So with that, um, uh, where are we? We're in our offering. So in the book of Psalms, uh, the writer reminds us that everything we have comes from God who gives us more than we can imagine. And he refers to the the foundational event in the life of the Hebrew people. God gave orders to his skies above, opened heaven's doors, and rained manna on them so they could eat. He gave them the very grain of heaven. Each person ate the bread of the powerful ones. God sent provisions to satisfy them. Since everything we have is from God, when we return what we have to God, it is an act of faith that God will continue to meet our needs and um, and an opportunity to uh, show our, thank you, our thanks to God for what he's given us. So um, there are ways we can do that. Uh, we have electronic giving, and I need to keep removing that other slide. So, um, so, but this is the good church. I tell them they're the good church. So, um, so give to jlp.church slash give, or uh, there's a box in back, or you can use the mail, those of you who are online. Um, uh, you can support this church. And if if you're not comfortable with churches, you know, maybe you've been hurt before, find something that is close to God's heart and give generously there because everything we have is from God. Let us now return our thanks to God. I think this is printed in your program, the prayer of dedication. Let us pray. God of wonder, we offer you these humble gifts, signs of your goodness and mercy. Receive them with our gratitude so that through us, all people may know the riches of your love in Jesus, the Word made flesh. Amen. For those of you who are worshiping with us online, let me invite you to use the chat so that others know you're here or there, that you're with us in spirit and with them in spirit, and uh, that maybe you could use that if you need to share any prayers or if you need to see what their particular prayer concerns or joys are so you can be part of that. So use the chat if you would. All right, with that, let us, um, let us come before God now and continue in prayer. O oh Lord, our God, we pray that you would accept our prayers and in mercy, 
Look with compassion on all that turn to you for help. We pray, Lord, that you would strengthen them in their hour of need and give them perseverance and courage to face the future and to be a firm foundation on which they may rebuild their lives. We think today particularly of everyone who is grieving the loss of our friend and sister Marjorie, uh, that um, you would uh, especially help the family make the arrangements they need to make so that we can um, offer them our services for a uh, memorial service for Marjorie. We pray for people in our nation and in other nations who are in authority. We pray for our president, our governor, our mayor, that you would give them wisdom beyond their own understanding and courage to choose the right path. We pray, O oh God, for our representatives, our courts, our military forces, and our first responders, that they would know what is right and they would do it. In the same way, O oh God, we lift up to you others known from our congregation, asking that you would bring healing to Jenny's brother Wyatt and for those that we name now in the private intentions of our hearts. Grant us, O Lord, that we may not be anxious about anything, but rely always on your grace and mercy, even now while we live in a world where your kingdom is present but not yet visible. Enable us to hold tight to the things that will endure. Give us strong faith and help us to trust your promises so we may live fearless lives as your children. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord, who taught us to pray together, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our sins, as we forgive those who sin against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Please pray with me. Lord God, may your word be a lamp to our feet and a light to our path. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. This morning's reading is from Mark chapter 8, verses 1 through 10. Listen for God's word to you. In those days, there was another large crowd with nothing to eat. Jesus called his disciples and told them, I feel sorry for the crowd because they've been out with me for three days and have had nothing to eat. If I send them away hungry to their homes, they won't have enough strength to travel, for some have come a long distance. His disciples responded, How can anyone get enough food in this wilderness to satisfy these people? Jesus asked, How much bread do you have? They said, Seven loaves. He told the crowd to sit on the ground. He took the seven loaves, gave thanks, broke them apart, and gave them to his disciples to distribute, and they gave the bread to the crowd. They also had a few fish. He said a blessing over them, then gave them to the disciples to hand out also. They ate until they were full. They collected seven baskets full of leftovers. This was a crowd of about 4,000 people. Jesus sent them away, then got into a boat with his disciples and went over to the region of Dalmanutha. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks, God. So, uh, I, uh, a, a week and a day ago, a week ago yesterday, I went to the, or I participated in the Out of Darkness Walk downtown. Thank you. Um, for both of you. The simultaneous signaling. So, so, uh, uh, so I participated in the Out of Darkness Walk, which was really good. We had a we had a big team. That's our team. Uh, team Iris uh, participated this year, and I know some of you participated by donating to the cause. So, the Out of Darkness Walk is by the American Foundation for for Suicide Prevention, and the purpose is to raise awareness and to uh, seek to do do uh, things, interventions that would help with suicide. So, I think it's a good cause. Um, 
And there were a lot of people there. And that is a very sobering thing. When you, when you look at a crowd the size of that one and you realize how many people in our community have, been, have had their lives affected by suicide, either a family member or a friend or something like that. And it's, it's, um, it, it, is, uh, it moves the, the problem from your head where you know about it to your, to your guts. It's a visceral experience to see, to see how big of a problem it is in our community. And it reminds you what, what we, again, we know intellectually, but maybe not in our gut, which is Alaska is a dark place. And I know that, that the world is a dark place. You know, Alaska is not unique, but um, you know, there's, there's plenty of problems in the world. There's violence and uh, warfare, there's hunger and famine. There's lots of problems in the world. But uh, particularly uh, relative to the United States, Alaska is, is pretty high up on a lot, of, a lot of metrics that you don't want to be high up on. So for example, Alaska is number two in the country right now for suicide. Uh, it's number three for domestic violence. There's other diseases of despair and social pathologies that Alaska is, is too high up on the rankings in. And um, again, this is not something you don't know, but it's something that maybe you, you don't feel very often. And one of the problems with, with that, when you say, well, yeah, there's, there's a lot of darkness in Alaska, um, that you, you may say, well, yeah, but where do you start? What do you do about it? You know, what, what can you do about problems this big? And the, the good news is that God can do something. And in fact, God already has done something. God's heart breaks. Uh, God hearts, God's heart breaks for the darkness in this world. And he sent Jesus to overcome the darkness. And Jesus has conquered. Jesus risen, rose victorious as we sing at Easter time. Jesus has risen victorious from, from the grave and has overcome the darkness. And really, we believe that there is nothing left but mopping up. The darkness, its, its defeat is, is already accomplished and now there's just lingering traces of darkness in this world. So, so what Jesus did uh, while he's away is he said to the church, he established the church and said, you will be light in the darkness. So Jesus said that uh, the, the solution for the darkness, Jesus has overcome it. He said, in the near term, until he returns, you, the church, are the light of the world. A city on top of a hill can't be hidden. Let your light shine before people so they can see the good things you do and praise your Father who is in heaven. So this is the way that Jesus defines the work of the church in the Sermon on the Mount, that this is, this is our job, that our job is not to overcome the darkness. Jesus has already done that. But our job is to shine with his light in the darkness of the world. So that's what the church is doing until he returns. And so at this point, I could pray, and then we could all leave, and you could go back to shining in the darkness. But before you do, um, I want to encourage you, don't make the mistake the disciples made. Because, because what happened with them is they became overwhelmed. They, they looked at the size of the problem, and they said, I don't even know where to start. How would you even, what would you do about that? And so, so I want to encourage you by looking at the lesson we see here in our reading today. So we're looking, as I mentioned to the children, we're looking at the story of the feeding of the 4,000. There's another, there's another um, story similar to it in the, the New Testament or in some of the gospel accounts called the feeding of the 5,000. And it actually appears in all, all of the gospel accounts, the feeding of the 5,000. This one is a, a similar event. Some, some scholars think that they're, they're, um, somehow or another people got confused and they confused the two. Um, I'm not persuaded by those scholars from what I can find reading and just looking at the accounts. There's sufficient differences. I think they really are two different, two different events, so we're going to treat them that way. Um, uh, and one of the first ones is, is right here at the beginning. It says here, so we're in chapter 8 of Mark's Gospel. And it says, in those days there was another large crowd with nothing to eat. So, so he says another. That's a, that's a hint. You know, Mark has noticed there's two of these feedings. And he says, in those days. So what days are those? Those are the days that Jesus was on this trip. So, so we, we've been looking at this for the last couple of weeks. Jesus normally operated, at this part in his point in his ministry, he normally operated out of the region of the Holy Land called Galilee. So that's, um, that is to the, the west of the Sea of Galilee. But what Jesus has done is he's gone up the coast. He's gone up to, um, to the, what is today Lebanon. So he's gone up to Tyre and Sidon. And then he went inland. So now he's further east and he's coming back down on the east side of the Jordan River and the, the Sea of Galilee. So those regions, there are Jews there. There's Jews everywhere in, in the first century. 
but there aren't many. This is mainly Gentile country. So, so Jesus is in, a, so in those days is part of that trip. So Jesus is on this trip and there is another large crowd with nothing to eat. So Jesus says, he called his disciples. I said, I feel sorry for the crowd because they've been with me for three days and have nothing to eat. Now that's kind of weak language. It says, I feel sorry for them. And you know, I feel sorry for all kinds of things. But Jesus actually uses stronger language. And in the, the message paraphrased, Eugene Peterson says, my heart is breaking for these people. And I would say even that is a little weak. The, the word literally means my guts are wrenched. So I'm tied up in knots inside by the situation of the crowd. It breaks my heart what's going on. And what is that? He says, if I send them away hungry to their homes, they won't have enough strength to travel for some have come from a long distance. So they have, they've come there, they've been listening to Jesus or getting healed by Jesus or whatever's going on uh, for three days. And if they brought any food, they've used it up now. And so Jesus says, my heart breaks for them. If I send them home, they're gonna faint on the way. So he brings this problem to the disciples and um, uh, the, the, the reason he does so is because Jesus cares for outsiders just like insiders. That this is going to surprise the disciples and maybe one of the reasons is because Jesus is in the wrong place, right? If he was in Galilee, then of course his heart would break for them. But he's in Gentile country and maybe, maybe in Gentile country he feels sorry for them but his heart doesn't get wrenched, right? He's not, he's not sick to his stomach over what's happening, right? So, so the, the lesson here, first of all, is that no, actually Jesus does care for outsiders just as much as insiders. So, so uh, we shouldn't be surprised that he's doing a feeding miracle in Gentile country any more than the miracle he did when he was in Galilee. So his disciples come to him or respond. They say, how can anyone get enough food in this wilderness to satisfy these people? And you know, as I mentioned to the children, there are, there's a large crowd and there's no grocery stores. Back in chapter 6, if you read the story of the feeding of the 5,000, the problem there is different. The, it's, it, the disciples say, where would we get enough money, right? There's towns, you know, we're in a field or something, and there's towns, you know, villages in the nearby area. We can send them out to get food, but where we, you know, it's 5,000 people. How are we going to possibly um, pay for it all? But that's not the problem here. They don't even get to the, how do we pay for it? It's like, look around. Where would you get food? We are in a wilderness. There's no, nobody who can give us food. And, um, and that's, that's astonishing that, that, uh, that they, would, they would say those words and not know the answer to it. Because if, if you're a first century Jew or probably a modern day Jew, and somebody says, food in the wilderness, you're going to think, manna from heaven. This is like somebody who grew up in our culture forgetting there was a holiday called Christmas, right? It is, in, it is inconceivable that somebody could grow up in this culture and not know about Christmas, at least that it exists, right? And for a first century Jew, if you said wilderness and hungry, they would have immediately thought manna in the wilderness. So they say, well, where would you get food? They, it's astonishing that they can't you know, connect the dots in their head here. And maybe it's because they're thinking, well, these guys are Gentiles, right? God gives Jews um, manna in the wilderness, but, but, you know, why would he feed Gentiles? Or maybe it's even, maybe it's even, God loves Gentiles, sure, but there's only so much manna that God can make. And so he's run out, he used it all up back during the Exodus, or, or, he wouldn't waste it on Gentiles or, or whatever. They, they've got some idea that there's a limitation here, that somehow or another, that if, if they connect the dots at all, if they think about man at all, they, they think that this crowd's too, too much. It's the wrong people, or it's the wrong time in history, or maybe God is just all fresh out of manna. So they say, how could anyone get enough food in the wilderness to satisfy these people? And Jesus doesn't say, how could you possibly forget Christmas? Right? How could you possibly forget the exodus and the feeding of the, the people in the wilderness for 40 years? How could you forget that? Instead, Jesus just says, okay, how much bread do you have? And they say seven loaves. And I don't know if they got these from a kid, but uh, we know in the earlier when they did. So, so Jesus um, uh, tells the crowd to sit on the ground. 
And he took the seven loaves, gave thanks, broke them apart, gave them to the disciples to distribute, and they gave the bread to the crowd. Now, we have to stop and think here, okay? So picture in your mind a crowd of 4,000 people, right? These are not co-religionists, so people who have a different religious faith, okay? And they're maybe from the other side of a border, okay? And there's 4,000 of them, and they're hungry. It's been three days since they got any food. And Jesus gives you, well, let's see, seven loaves, 12 disciples. Let's say he rips everyone in half. Everybody gets a half a loaf, and he's got two more left over. And he gives one of you one of those half loaves and says, okay, distribute that. And so your job is to wade into that crowd and give it to somebody. Now, maybe you've heard the story of the starfish. I, I, my thought went to the, the starfish story. You've heard the story maybe. The little girl and the man are walking along the beach and there's been a storm and somehow or another the storm washed a bunch of starfish up on the beach. And the little girl, she sees the starfish and so she'll bend over and pick one up and throw it out in, in, the, in the ocean. But the, but the man says, there's thousands and thousands of starfish. You can't possibly make a difference. And the little girl picks up another starfish, throws it out into the ocean, says, I made a difference for that one. Now, I'm not criticizing people who do that. People who have the, the ability to walk into a crowd or walk along a, a beach and help out the way they can, you know, with whatever they can do, right? Good for them, right? But I will tell you, I would rather walk along a beach and chuck starfish into the ocean than wander into a crowd of strangers that is hungry and I don't have enough food for more than one or two of them because that could turn very ugly very quickly. Why did you give him, are you holding back? Where's mine, right? That could get very ugly. So, so if the disciples are a little obtuse and somehow or another forgot about man in the wilderness, we have to give them credit. Jesus said, wade into that crowd and they waded into the crowd. So good for them, right? But if you're, if you're looking at a problem and you're saying, I have to do something, right? There's starfish on the beach. There's hungry people in the crowd. And you say, I'm going to do something, right? I admire people who are willing to do that, who are willing to look at a big problem and say, this is a place where I can make a difference. Good for them, right? But they will be the first to tell you it's not about them, right? They are noble people. They are ambitious. They're doing something good. But they will tell you, yeah, but it's not about me. It's about the starfish. It's about the hungry people. That it's not about you know, a test of my faith or something like that. So, so what, what we can say is that as good as it is to throw those starfish back, as good as it is to wade into the crowd and feed people some bread, or one or two people some bread, it's even better if you can deal with the whole problem, if you can solve the whole problem. And that's the difference between shining with our own light and shining with Jesus' light. So they do. And, you know, great faith. I don't know how this is going to turn out. This mob could turn, or this crowd could turn into a mob. But I'm going to do it because Jesus said so. That's great faith. And maybe their hearts are aching for the people being hungry too. But they go out there expecting, I think, for the bread to run out. But they keep passing it out and it keeps not running out. And that's shining with the light of Jesus. Ordinary people can shine with our own light. We can be good people in a bad situation. And we can shine with our own light. But when we go into a situation and do the impossible, that's shining with the light of Jesus in a dark world. So the crowd eats until they're full. The word full here is used for fattening cattle. <laughs> they are gorged. They are, they are ready for market now. So, so they are absolutely full. They collect seven baskets full of leftovers. And I'm guessing, since this is a crowd of people who have come from a far off place and it's been, and they've already flirted with hunger once, my guess is a lot of people stuff food in their pockets along the, the, the way here. So they're thinking, I've got to have something to get back. So they got their, their fish and their uh, um, bread in their baskets and so, or their pockets. So there's a crowd of about 4,000 people. And the lesson here is that 
is that compassion without Jesus can seem foolish, right? That little girl with the, the starfish, right? The, the man in the story says, you know, honey, you can't, you can't make a difference. And she says, well, I'm young and stupid and I can, I can because I'm not afraid to look foolish. So, so it's good that there are people who are willing to take on impossible odds. That's a good thing. But when you add Jesus, it becomes actually something that, that can solve the problem, not simply um, make a difference for one or two people. And that is what faith is all about. Faith, we see this over and over again through the, through the, um, through the uh, uh, scriptures. We see the way God says, okay, take the first step and then I'll do my part. And, and so, so when Joshua is crossing into the Holy Land, uh, the, the Jordan River is at flood. It's as deep as it ever gets. It's running as fast as it ever gets. And he says, tell the priest to walk in and then I'll stop the water. And the priests do that. And then God stops the water. And I don't know why God likes to operate that way, but that is faith, right? You do what you can do and then I'll take care of it from there. And you know, if, if God would just let us off the hook and not make us act in faith, then we wouldn't have this, this problem. But that's the way God wants us to operate in the world, is to trust Him. And I heard somebody once say that, that the, the distance between where you are now, your current situation, and what you're hoping for, right? A beach with all the starfish cleared off, or I keep using that example. I'm not a marine biologist. I don't know if that's a good thing, like seagulls depend on starfish. You know, I, I, so I, I do have the Bible story, so I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to stick to the bread and the, the wilderness, right? People need to eat. So, so um, when, when, went off on a tangent there, where am I? So, um, so he fed them. Okay, so we're there. All right, so, so um, there, there, you, can, you can shine with your own light, but it's better to shine with Jesus' light because that gives you the hope of solving the whole problem. That your faith, the, the arena between, between, uh, between where you are and what you're hoping for is the place where God operates. That that, and so you know, some of us have very little faith because we're assuming I'm gonna have to solve the, the starfish problem or the bread problem or the, the suicide problem all on my own. And so we have very little faith. But if we, if we have a hope that is much bigger than we can achieve, that's great faith and that gives God a place to work, a place to operate in. So, so that is what faith is all about and I, I don't know why God does that, but we see it all through the scriptures. This is the way that God calls us to live in faith. So, so that brings us back to the darkness. And the, the question is, how are you shining? You know, are you shining with your own light or with the light of Jesus? You know, the, the darkness is a given. We know there's darkness. And I assume you, you make an effort not to contribute more to the darkness than to the light. I'm, I'm going to take that for granted. But how are you shining? You know, what are you doing that's impossible? You know, what are you doing that's irrational? There's a church I admire. Um, we're using one of their products today, the church online platform. There's a church I admire, and one of their slogans they use is they say, we will lead the way with irrational generosity. And so they, they do all kinds of things that support the greater church and just ordinary Christians. If you go to your app store on your phone and you look for Bible, there's something there called the Bible app. They're close to a billion downloads that they have, they have paid for. And they've, they've negotiated with the, um, the publishers to get the rights to the Bible. They put it on the app stores. They've developed the software. And they do it all for free because they are leading the way with irrational generosity. So, so I would ask you, what are you doing that's irrational or impossible, something that can't be done without Jesus? You know, is your faith the kind where it's like, really, if God doesn't show up, I'm fine with that because I'm going to do my little bit and that's good enough? Or do you have a hope? Are you working on something that's out there, something that is, that is beyond what you could do yourself? Because, because as good as it is, there's nothing wrong with trying to make a difference in your own strength. That's good. But it's really not about you. It's about the people. And can you solve the problem of all the hungry people, all the starfish, all the people whose lives have been affected by suicide? So, how are you shining? 
And I will close with this thought. So it's interesting to me that Jesus foresaw the problem, right? Jesus didn't wait until the problem happened, right? He could have said, okay, off you go now. And they would have fainted along the way, right? Because they'd come from a long distance. Jesus saw that. They were hungry, but they weren't fainting. But Jesus looked ahead and he said, if I dismiss the crowd, some of them will, will faint along the way. Now, you know, Jesus is Jesus. What he could have done is kind of the reverse of modern search and rescue operations. He could have released them and then sent out his disciples, 12 disciples trying to find how many of the 4,000 fainted and he could heal them, right? Jesus could do that. But Jesus chose to solve the problem upstream. Jesus chose to solve the problem while it was still, I want to say manageable, but it's not manageable. I mean, it's still an impossible problem. But for whatever reason, Jesus chose to solve the problem that way by, by feeding the 4,000 instead of searching and rescuing 4,000 people scattered across the wilderness. And we have in this congregation seen a problem coming for several years, and it is that we are, as a congregation, aging. I mean, you could say that about any group of people, but this congregation is aging, and one of the things we've been trying to do as a congregation is to equip and empower a new generation to carry on the mission of this church, because our mission is important, because Alaska leads the state, leads the, the country in some ways in the darkness of this world. And so it's important that this church carry out its mission to be its city on a hill, to, to shine with Jesus' light in the darkness. We can't simply say, well, you know, that's not my problem. Deal with it when it comes. That would be as foolish as if the disciples said, oh, Jesus, don't worry about it. They'll be fine. We can't ignore the problem that we've identified. Now, a year ago, I told you that I thought we could find somebody by Christmas who would lead our efforts in that area to, to actually build a family ministry so that this church could actually minister to families who in turn would take over the leadership of this church. And because I'm hopelessly naive, I've always been on the other side of the search process, so I have no idea, right? And I have greater respect for those of you who've been involved in it before. It's a hard problem. You know, I'm sure there is the right person out there, but it feels sometimes like, well, what could we do next? So I would ask you to support us as we go about this, as we go about the work of trying to find somebody to build that ministry, to, to help us all build that ministry. You know, first pray, pray for that person, whoever they are, um, that we can connect with them at all. And second, help us communicate Help us refine our messaging so that we can, we can communicate what the problem is that we're asking them to work on and what sort of resources they'll have to, to, to take it on when they, when they arrive. Help us to connect with that person and then to, uh, to help them catch a vision of what we're trying to do. And then, and then lastly, help us in the meantime because that person hasn't been identified. But we know there's a problem. We know that this church is aging. And we know the darkness is still out there. And so we have to figure out what to do in the meantime. So I encourage you to do that. Shine with your own light in your own, in your own circumstances. Be that, be that incurable person who takes on the whole beach full of starfish, who takes on the crowd that could become a mob. Lead the way with irrational generosity. Do something impractical, add a zero to what you're doing because that's what Jesus means when he says, don't shine with your own light. I mean, do, but shine with my light. Offer what you have to me so that I can multiply it because you, we, are a city on a hill shining in the darkness. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, Help us to trust that if we take that first step, you will do what we cannot, that you will clear the beach, that you will feed the multitude, that you will overcome the darkness, 
that we see around us here in this beautiful state that can be so dark. We ask this through Christ our Lord. Amen. Please stand as you're able and join in singing our hymn. May the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you this day and forevermore. Amen. Amen.